Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is the first community forum for the um, Bridge Street Neck Neighborhood Zoning Overlay District. We're very excited to have you here today. Um, I'm going to give us uh, one more minute to wait for a few more folks who I know have registered um, but haven't been able to join yet, and then we'll get started shortly. Um, if you have any questions um, now or during the, or comments now or during the um, forum, please feel free to post those in the chat. Um, you'll be able to communicate with uh, myself um, and my other MAPC colleague, Chris, and the city. Um, to get to the chat, it's just uh, located if you're on your computer or your iPhone or other smartphone on the bottom middle of your screen. If you are on your tablet, it's in the top left corner, top right corner, excuse me. Um, so I think actually we can go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to um, my colleague, Chris. Well, hi everybody. Actually, uh, let's start by turning it over to um, City Councilor Madore if you want to say a few words and then I'll take it away. Sure. Thank you, Chris and Christian. I'm uh, really excited to see, actually, we were expecting a lower turnout, but I'm excited to see that more people are starting to trickle in, and especially on a Wednesday night, and very excited to, to see this level of participation. And just a reminder, if you know any neighbors who aren't able to participate this evening, we will be repeating the forum next Thursday at the same time. And go to the, the same place to register for the second forum on the website. And I'll just very briefly say that this has been a long time coming. This project started, I believe two counselors ago or three counselors ago back in uh, 10 years ago nearly. And that you know we've already heard a lot of feedback thus far and because of so many changes along the corridor and, and the real estate market, we decided that a new vision for the neighborhood uh, is warranted. So we went through a visioning process pre-pandemic, uh, just right before the pandemic and heard a lot of good feedback. And um, in contrast to the previous efforts, we haven't actually gotten this far with proposing uh, any zoning proposals. So this is a really important milestone. I'm glad that folks are, are interested in sharing their thoughts. And we do want to make sure that, that we keep on, uh, keep on the topic of um, just the main corridor. And I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody. And thank you for MAPC for supporting throughout the years, as well as our, our staff planner, Amanda Chinkola. She's put into a lot of work for this and, and the working group as well that has stuck with us for the last 10 years. And I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you, thanks for those words. Um, so for those who don't know, MAPC, we are the regional planning agency for the Metro Boston area. So we're a, a quasi state agency. We wear a number of hats. Um, in this case, we're essentially acting as a consultant to the town, to the city to help um, sort of implement um, an, an aspect of, of the vision. Uh, next slide, please. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're, we're talking about zoning, um, and it, it gets pretty dense. So we have a, a lot of ground to cover. So what we're going to do is we are going to take it in chunks. So I'm going to uh, we're going to give a presentation, and then we're actually going to stop, and we're going to have a try and have a bit of a discussion. I know it's always tougher on Zoom than in person, but we're trying, going to try to use that to get your feedback um, on on a few aspects of the zoning. And then we'll continue the presentation and then same thing, we'll break again and we'll do that one more time as well. Um, next slide. And I think before we get into that, um, we have a few questions just about who's in this room and, and Christian, I'll let you kind of guide people how, on how to answer these. Um, Chris, I did not set up the questions in advance. So I can set those up now and um, then I will, we can launch them later. Sorry about that. All right, slight snafu. Well, um, next slide then, please. So we're talking about zoning. Um, I, I, I'm guessing many of you know to some degree what zoning is, but some of you really might not. And so I just wanted to take a minute just to give a very simplified view of what tends to be an actually a very complex and complicated um, aspect of, of a city's ordinance. So what zoning is, it, it sets the framework that are the rules and the expectations for your land and how it's developed. 
So your city is completely divided into these different zoning districts. They all have different names. Each district has different uses that are allowed, different dimensional standards. So that's things like how tall a building can be, how far back it can be from, um, from the street, the amount of parking that is required, and then a whole number of potentially other regulations. Uh, you have some zoning ordinances that apply just for certain districts, some that apply citywide. Um, so that's sort of what zoning is. There are things that zoning cannot do. And I think this is also something that sometimes people get a little sort of confused about is zoning can't force a develop a landowner to develop their property. Um, they also kind of similarly, they, they can't dictate that a certain use be located in on a certain parcel. So an example is you can say that you want a restaurant and you can have the zoning allow a restaurant. You can't actually force a restaurant to go into a place. Um, so you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have a website, publicinput.com slash Bridge Street Neck. Um, including it here, um, this has a lot of great information um, about the project. There are opportunities for you to provide your feedback in addition to tonight. But we also have um, things like frequently asked questions and we have um, a glossary of terms. So just things that I think will help you um, if you're interested um, as we kind of move forward with this. Next slide. So as Councilor Lamador said, planning for Bridge Street Net goes back actually over a decade now. Um, so back in 2009, um, the city worked with uh, a private consultant, the Cecil Group, to develop a, what was a revitalization plan that had a number of recommendations and strategies to help shape the future. Uh, a few years later, they worked on some rezoning for this area. Um, to help implement some of those recommendations. It, it ended up not being adopted or moving forward um, for whatever reason. And then as Council Lador said, in the interim of several years, um, the neighborhood really changed a lot. Um, and, there's, and when I say change, those are both related to demographic changes as well as to actual physical changes of the neighborhood. And so when the city sort of picked this back up a few years ago, um, at first it was starting to sort of be, okay, let's implement the zoning as recommended by Cecil Group. But it quickly became apparent that so much had changed that we actually needed to take a step back. And we sort of pivoted and um, decided to look more holistically and develop a vision plan for this area. And so that was completed last year. And so this now, this zoning is directly tied to helping to implement aspects of that vision. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. Next slide. So this vision plan, I think, you know, one of the takeaways that I, I just wanted to sort of highlight here is this was very much intended to be a community led vision plan by members of the, the neighborhood itself, sort of determining its own fate. So MAPC, we're sort of facilitators here more than, um, you know, the driving force behind it. Um, this vision plan is on the website that I mentioned. That's also at the bottom of the screen now. Um, so if you're really interested, you can take a look um, and read the whole plan or, or skim it. Uh, just a couple highlights. Um, you know, people generally, in terms of consensus, want this neighborhood in the future to be family friendly and affordable across a whole range of incomes. They want people to be able to walk and bike safely to get around. Um, the neighborhood has such a, a rich history and people want to be able to build upon that history so that future development is compatible. And that sort of ties with the last bullet that people want the design to really be appropriate for the context in the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. So this then answers the question, why are we working on this zoning district, which is called an overlay district? Um, first reason and main reason, uh, next slide, is to help implement the vision. So the vision plan contains a number of recommendations in a number of areas. Um, these, this includes things like um, multimodal transportation improvements and recommendations. Um, people had a lot of um, input and interest in historic preservation aspects. And so zoning touches upon some of those, but in many ways, those are separate initiatives. And so we have recommendations in the plan and that the city can sort of move forward. Um, zoning is a little bit of a separate animal, but nevertheless, really one of the most important um, tools at a city's disposal to help actually try and implement the vision. And so rather than actually really in detail rehashing the vision, as we go throughout the presentation, um, I'll highlight 
times where aspects of the zoning directly tie into how it would is is intended to implement the vision and what we heard from the vision visioning process. Next slide. The other reason of doing this district um, is, is much more technical. Um, it's a little dense, but I, I, we thought it was important to take a minute and try to explain it. And it's an issue of dealing with what are called existing non-conforming uses. So as I noted, every district in your city has a number of uses that are either allowed or prohibited. There are often situations where you have a use that is currently in existence, but isn't actually allowed under the zoning code. So it might be because there was a business or a home that was already there when the use um, occurred. And that creates sort of a special situation in the city. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll have the simple flow chart to try to explain what the issue is. So within Bridge Street Neck, um, part of that is, is covered by what is called the business highway district. Uh, now you might have a situation where you have a two family home in the business highway, um, which isn't actually allowed in business highway, but it was already in existence. You might get to a point where the landowner decides they want to redevelop their property. So they have two options really. One option is if they want to develop it as um, something that is one of the allowed uses, that's a conforming use. So let's say in office use, well, then they, of course, have to follow all the rules and regulations as it pertains to, to that district, so the heights, et cetera. But they also actually have an option potentially of um, having developing under to another non-conforming use. And so in this situation, what could happen is an owner of a two-family in business highway could decide that they want to develop a multifamily home and apply for a special permit. And what could happen is, in some situations, this could result in a building that members of the community actually don't like for some reason. Maybe it's out of scale or it's just the character doesn't fit. Uh, next slide. And we actually went, we wanted to kind of look at this and to see how much of a potential issue this could be within um, the proposed area of this um, proposed ordinance. Um, and actually, as you can see, over half of the parcels are concurrently non-conforming and then have actually this option. I'm um, just one example of this that we know from the vision that people really saw as a value coffee time as a business that people just really love in the neighborhood. Um, and that's actually a non-conforming use. It's, it's actually zoned as a residential use. So next slide, please. And so really the takeaway is by including some of these uses as part of a cohesive district, the neighborhood actually has the opportunity to then set what the rules and requirements are. So going back to my example with the multifamily, if that's included as part of the overlay district, well now they're subject to the requirements of the overlay district. Um, it's, you know, we can hopefully ensure that the density is appropriate, the scale's appropriate, the architecture's appropriate, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to uh, hand it over now to um, Amanda Chancola, your Deputy Director of Planning. Hey there, thank you, Chris. So I'm gonna go over the type of zoning district, the boundaries and the uses that we're proposing. And then I'll hand it back to Chris to take over parking. And then we'll go into our discussion with all of you. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different ways you can craft a zoning ordinance. This clip here is from page 51 of the vision update study that was prepared in 2020, um, and that's available on the public input website. So the table just shows all the different options that we looked at. Um, and now Chris just went over that issue of non-conforming uses. Well, we wanted to make sure that the proposed zoning allows the kind of uses that you want, but it doesn't make the existing uses non-conforming as well. Um, and so again, we went through the pros and cons of each and landed with an overlay district. Um, because as you're aware, Bridge Street Neck has this really neat ecosystem of a bunch of different uses. We have homes, automo automotive shops, there's a salon, restaurants, a record store, a paint store, yoga studio, it just goes on and on. Um, but with half of those being non-conforming, how do you make sure that you keep those desired uses, but the ones that are already conforming continue to allow those? Um, and at the public forum we held back in 2019, it was unanimous among the participants that the people 
that we heard from want to retain the existing uses and the character. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And the overlay keeps the base zoning. So this is your base zoning and that remains. And the overlay is just like it sounds. It sits over that base zoning on top of it. And it provides an alternate development option um, that the property owner can opt into. So it really is optional. And all the things that were already um, conforming continue to be conforming. And all the desired uses that you propose in there would now be conforming but they have to comply with the design standards that are part of this overlay. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this is the proposed boundary of the overlay. Um, so you can see it follows the boundary of Bridge Street Neck. It's about one parcel deep on each side of the street and extends from Webb Street up to the bridge. Um, we are using this district or proposing this because through the vision and process, we heard that the primary focus of the zoning changes should really just be along that stretch of Bridge Street Neck. Next slide, please. So we're proposing, um, so these are the uses, okay? We went through the zoning district, the location process, um, and now we can start diving into the uses. All of the uses shown on this slide are proposed at, to be permitted in the overlay. Um, Bridge Street Neck District currently has four different zoning districts in it. Uh, those are listed in this black box, uses allowed in each zoning district. And the little boxes are color coded to identify the district the use is allowed in. So all the uses proposed here are allowed in at least one zoning district in the Bridge Street Neck neighborhood. And I say neighborhood because you'll notice that computer hardware development doesn't have that little color coded box next to it. That's just because it's not directly allowed on Bridge Street, but it's allowed in the industrial zone, which is within that general neighborhood. Um, so we're trying to keep the uses that are within that neighborhood, neighborhood serving uses um, with that commercial mixture. So one of the examples you'll see on here are is dwelling above first floor commercial. Um, and that's allowed in the teal or the business neighborhood. We call that B1 for short. Um, next slide, please. Oh, do you have the pictures of the, of those? Um, let's see if I can share. We can go on, I'll get to the image. I wanted to show you some examples of what the dwelling above first floor looks like. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is the review process that we're proposing, um, calling it base plus. Um, the red text highlights the base zoning process. Now that remains. The base zoning requires a site plan review from the planning board Sorry, Amanda. Oh, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I think the slide just got a little bit out of order. So if you skip this slide, we can stick with the uses and then come back to the process. Oh, so, here we go. Yeah. These are the proposed uses. So this is some examples of what it looks like to have mixed use development or commercial with a home above it. Um, so what's interesting here, these are all on Bridge Street Neck, all within a really short distance of each other. They're all in a different zoning district. One is in B1. And that's conforming. One of the uses there are in B2, so it's not conforming, and the other one is in B4, also not conforming. And these are the kind of uses that we heard are desired on Bridge Street Neck. Um, and so the overlay would allow this kind of use that you can have commercial with a home above it. Um, so it's just carrying forward those desired uses. And then this table shows that prior slide that I was discussing with uses. It just shows it in a different way. Um, you know, all of these uses, again, are proposed to be in the overlay. And the chart there is coordinated with the zoning map in the right-hand corner. Um, 
Each color represents a zoning district. So that salmon pinkish color means residential two family or R2. That really pretty teal um, is business neighborhood or B1. The brown is business highway or B2. And the navy blue is wholesale automotive B4. So again, if you think about that mixed use development, one of them's up here in the brown and B4, one of them's in the navy blue and one of them's in the teal, but only one of the three are conforming. So rather than having this patchwork of zoning, it allows those uses to carry forward. Next slide. Do you want me to go back to the, um, to the process slide? Yeah, let's talk about process. This is a little dense, so bear with me. And as Chris mentioned, there's a zoning glossary on the website um, and something we'll tell you, we'll talk about in more detail. We're going to set up office hours if you want to chat about a, any of these terms or have questions in more detail, um, we can walk through it. But I'm going to give you sort of the high level of the process. Um, so the red text is what is required under the base zoning, and it will continue to be required with the overlay. Um, base zoning requires a site plan review. So that's a process where the planning board looks at the plans and they evaluate the circulation, they look at the parking spaces, the landscaping, the building, the layout of it. Um, so the whole site plan. And right now site plan is required. If commercial development is more than 2000 square feet or if six units or more of residential are proposed. Now, any site plan review along Bridge Street Neck already requires a recommendation from the design review board. So again, red text, that's current and that's going to remain. Now the plus portion, this is what's added to the overlay. It adds on an administrative review process for development that's less than 2000 square feet, regardless of whether it's commercial or residential. And it adds on facade improvements as an administrative review. So that means that before a building permit could be pulled by someone, um, a planner would look at those plans and make sure that what's being proposed is in compliance with the design standards. Um, so you think about a small facade improvement, like a new window or a bump out to a building, um, that has to comply with the design standards, but it's not at that level of a site plan review. So it gets that administrative review. It's a smaller project. Um, and then the next plus is changing site plan review within the overlay from 2000 square to 2000 square feet. Um, from just before it was 2000 square feet for only commercial. Now it's 2000 square feet for everything. And that means it's really expanding the purview of our planning board. Um, Right now it's six units of residential. So if you think about a new unit at 700 square feet, three units would be 2,100 square feet. That means the planning board now reviews projects with fewer units. So just expanding their purview. Um, and then we're also proposing this design standard waiver. And this is because design standards just can't anticipate all the circumstances or design approaches. So the waiver can be applied for, but it requires a special permit concurrently with a site plan review. So remember I said, if a project's less than 2000 square feet or just a facade improvement, it's only an administrative review, but there's an exception. Um, if a design standard waiver is applied for, that automatically converts the application to a special permit and that requires a site plan review. So it kicks it to plan board and to the design review board. Um, and then for the planning board to approve the waiver, they have to make a finding. So this is a determination that they evaluate and look at in their decision and among their discussions um, that the underlying design objectives are in compliance with the vision update plan. So that's a, so a high level overview of the base plus option or base plus process. Next slide, please. Okay. And then these are parking requirements that I will hand over to Chris. 
Okay, last slide before we take a, a break and, and I know this is a lot to digest. I'll also note that this first section is what I think is the, the most dense part of the, of the night. So um, thank you for everyone for kind of bearing with this. Um, I, I know zoning can be a bit dry. Um, so last thing just to talk about is, is parking. Um, there's, there were really two aspects to the parking. One is the location of the parking and the second is the amount of the parking um, that's required as part of any development. Um, so again, very kind of loud and clear through the visioning process. Most participants said that they, they wanted to walk next to, to a building. Um, you know, they want to be able to window shop. They, they didn't want to walk next to um, an expanse of a large parking lot. Um, and so to that end, the proposed um, overlay district requires that parking is located where, where practicable, because in some situations it might not be, um, to the rear of the building or behind it or to the side of a building. Um, and it should be screened from the street um, and from adjacent properties. Um, and so, and, and you know, one of the other, I guess the flip side is there had been a couple concerns raised by land um, business owners who said, you know what, we, we like our front and center parking um, where everyone can just see it right away as they drive along Bridge Street. Um, and they actually then to that end, they can still use the base zoning to develop under their properties, which doesn't have these um, requirements. So they, they, it's not taking away um, any of the existing rights. I think that's one of the important aspects of, uh, of the overlay district. In terms of the amount of parking that's required um, for the district, it, it's based for, for residential units. It's based on the number of units that are part of that development. If there are commercial spaces, or um, then it's based upon the actual square footage. And so that's sort of the, the beginning base of what is required. And then there are opportunities potentially to reduce that slightly. Um, again, it's through a special permit process that Amanda was describing. And that could arise, one of the appropriate situations that we often see in areas like this are when you have a mix of uses on site. So let's say you have an office that's on the ground floor, um, though the parking associated with the office, typically those are during the day is when they're most needed. Um, when you have resident, if you have residences above that, um, typically at least some portion of those cars would be out during the day because they're, you know, say driving to work. And so there's an opportunity for some portion of those um, park required parking spaces to sort of um, count for both uses. All right, so with that, we're gonna pause here um, and maybe Christian, uh, you could go to the next slide, but I think, okay, I think we could probably stop sharing for a moment. Um, we work, we actually had two options here. We were either going to go into these two virtual breakout sessions, um, but I think the way the numbers are, I, I think it works just as well to, um, to take some comments just here in the main room. Um, so what I would encourage people to the extent that you are willing and able and comfortable to, to turn on your cameras. Um, and if you have any comments about what we just heard, we, we still are gonna go back and we have a lot more to hear. Um, but specifically the things we discussed, we discussed the boundaries of the zoning district. So we're focused along Bridge Street itself. We're not focused in other parts of the neighborhood. That was something that came through with the vision that people really wanted the focus along Bridge Street itself. Um, so if you have comments on that in terms of the boundaries. The uses, um, Amanda went through the uses. Um, in a nutshell, we're looking at a mixed use environment, um, but you know, any specifics of, of uses you really wanna have or uses you really don't wanna have or just general comments. Um, third is the process. Um, if you have comments on the process, um, I know that again, that's a very, maybe in some ways complicated aspect, but to the extent that you do, please share those. And then finally, on parking. Um, thoughts on parking requirements, parking location. Um, if you wish to you know, wave your hand or if you know how to use the um, raise hand function, um, we, we can call on you um, or you could also just call out. So please don't be shy. Um, I think I see Drew Nelson with their hand raised. And I see you're unmuted, so why don't you just go ahead? Thanks. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. This is very informative and helpful. Appreciate it. Um, and I don't know if this is for this conversation. So within the zoning, is there an aspect of traffic too? 
Um, there's just, there's, in the zoning, can there be a way of putting more through traffic over the bypass? Um, traffic to the commercial and traffic to the homes, totally want to encourage, but those very large vehicles that are driving by, just to drive by, and again, I don't know if this is the right forum, so that would be, it, I just don't know. Sure, I'll, I'll right just place. comment on that, and then obviously Amanda um, or Council Maduro or anybody else can, can jump in, but I, I would just say, uh, you know, that the, your question is something that comes up very often, um, and it, it's a good question. It's also an example of something where the zoning doesn't really um, sort of isn't the best avenue for you know focusing on through traffic because you're right I, I think we do know that most of the traffic it, it, there's often a lot of tr through traffic um, there are other means and so the, the vision plan does have recommendations as it relates to to this sort of transportation and connectivity issue um, but I think it's it's not achieved through zoning okay thank you um, Chris, thank you, Drew. That was a great question. Um, Chris, we I did get a question from uh, Gretchen in the chat. Um, and so she is wondering, <clears throat> can, and I think this is a good question about process. Um, she is wondering, can planning say no to a proposal if it doesn't meet the vision from 2020? Um, so, the vision is the sort of the highest level, like what, what do we want, right? And then the zoning is then trying to implement the vision. So the uses, the, the heights, all the things, and we're gonna discuss things like heights and setbacks um, in the next section. That's what your actual rules and regulations are. And so we say no, if you wanted to propose I don't know, let's say um, I, maybe a hotel that's not going to be allowed as part of the district. Um, if you want to do that, the answer is no, if it's not allowed. Um, so it's not, it's, it doesn't tie to the vision, it ties to the zoning because those are your actual city ordinances. But the zoning is based off of the vision, like it's an aim to achieve that, correct? Correct. Thank Great. Um, and then I, uh, Gretchen actually asked a second question, um, which is, um, are the parking, is the parking uh, requirement based on number of units or number of potential adults in the unit? Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, it's, um, it's, I've never seen it based on number of adults. I have seen it based upon number of bedrooms. Um, I, I think as we have it proposed right now, we have it set at um, it, one set, I think it's one and a half spaces per unit. So it's based upon units. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be something different. Again, if people have input on, on how they would like to see that structured. And I think I see Drew has their hand raised again. <laughs> a new question. Um, where it said um, highway business zoning, can you explain what that means? The other terms made perfect sense. I just didn't understand that one. Do you want to so, say that? Yeah, the business highway is a zoning district. Um, so I'm looking at my zoning map and that's you know, along Bridge Street and that, there's a portion of Canal Street that's also, um, oh, Business Highway, that's also along Highland Avenue. Um, a stretch of Boston Street is Business Highway. So that's where you- and What okay. does that mean? Is it just mostly just businesses? The business I get, but the highway, I'm like, what? I just didn't understand that one. Right, so that's the uses that are allowed. So um, businesses are allowed commercial uses are allowed, residential is not allowed in the business highway district. Great, thank I would you. just add that business highway, it's, it's sort of an, um, in some ways antiquated term, but many communities just have along their sort of arterial like or main roadways, they, they, the district is called business highway. It doesn't mean that it's on a highway. It's just the name of the district. Okay, great. Yeah, that the highway part was like, huh? Business made perfect sense. Thank you. Um, any other questions, again, as it relates to what, or, or not even questions, or feedback as it relates to um, those elements that we had just discussed? Would it be helpful if we showed, you know, the overlay and, um, you know, the boundaries or the uses for y'all to react to again? 
Yeah, let's put that up, please, Christian. And in the meantime, right. I see Gretchen has her hand raised, so you can um, ask your question. And you, you're on mute right now, though. Okay. Thank you. Um, the reason I asked the question about parking, because it sometimes seems that, um, and I don't live in a unit, I live in a private home, but it seems like some of the units might have three to four adults in it, therefore three to four cars. So that's just what I'm seeing in my local neighborhood. That's why I was interested in, I know I was part of the um, sessions in 2009 and 2012. So I've learned a lot from you all along the way because this is not my field of interest. Uh, interest, yes, profession, no. But um, it just seems like the quantity of cars goes up. Um, and now with post COVID, I'm wondering how that affects you all in the planning and the strategies because so much now is being done at home and remotely. All the formulas you've used, has that been challenged at all from the COVID pandemic and the era of COVID? It's the way people are working is so different. Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's a, it's a very big question. Um, and I, I think the truth is that there's a lot of opinions about the long-term effects of COVID. And I, I don't think there's any consensus. Um, I certainly have my own personal opinion is that long-term things won't change too much as it relates to, to planning. Um, I think more people will be working from home, but I, I don't think that's necessarily going to affect things like parking requirements um, to the same degree. One of the things that, you know, that I know Salem puts a lot of emphasis on and, and to its credit does a really great job um, in our region among our communities is really trying to incentivize and allow people to get around in ways that don't just rely on a car. Obviously people, a number of people want and need a car, but I think there's a lot of people who would, are, are attracted to an environment like Bridge Street who don't need a car for every trip and, and want to be able to bike around. And so that's some of the things that, it, you know, it really plays into those other parts of the recommendations um, for the city to sort of help implement and, and truly realize the vision. Um, so this is the uses. Do we want to look at real quick and before we move on the, the actual boundaries or is this what you were looking for, Amanda? I think we can start here with the uses. I'm wondering if, you know, take a look at these uses. We added in these industrial that, um, you know, I don't think we're part of prior conversations, but they're neighborhood serving uses. And so they, they seem to fit. So I'm wondering, you know, does this group feel that these uses are, are a good fit for Bridge Street? Are there uses that we're missing that should be added? Um, so um, John Henry actually had a very apropos question for this, and that is um, if the current situation is that the majority of buildings are non-conforming, um, does the overlay just make it easier for um, those to be built in the, like for those to be built or developed in the future? I, I don't wouldn't say it necessarily makes it easier because as it is, they if it's non-conforming, they they have that opportunity to go to another non-conforming. If anything, it it might make it um a little more stringent because now there are specific set rules that they have to abide by. So before it, like my example was if they just wanted to do if they were non-conforming and wanted to go to another non-conforming use like a multifamily, they could you know, within reason, almost do what they want. Just for I'm, I'm exaggerating to some degree, um, but they they there were no set clear rules. I guess is maybe a better way to describe it. Now there will be set rules, and they have to abide by that. And Amanda, if, if I said anything incorrect, feel free to clarify that. Right. So that that issue with the non-conforming use to an exist an existing non-conforming to another non-conforming that requires a special permit through our zoning board of appeals. Um, and the board, the zoning board has to find that the new non-conforming use is less de detrimental than the current non-conforming use. But again, there's no design standards, there's no structure around um, a vision for this. And so this puts structure on it. It, it, makes, it makes you know what that outcome will be and that's within the vision. I just quickly add something, this is Christine Medor. Um, I think it's really important to point out that this overlay district, so using the example of going from one non-conforming to another non-conforming, so say if, if Coffee Time wants to, for an, a reason that I hope never happens, uh, turn into a multifamily, they can do that now, but not within the vision laid out by this plan. So the intent of the overlay is to really put in 
a set of rules and regulations that is actually informed by the neighborhood itself that only applies to this neighborhood and nowhere else. Because right now, any kind of non-conforming uses to another non-conforming uses follows the rules that applies across the city. And we know that the Bridge Neck neighborhood is, has a very unique set of character and scale that we wanna be able to preserve and that is going to be achieved by an overlay. Um, so I think Drew has a question and then I think we should probably start moving on to the next section to keep on time. Okay, thank you. So as I'm looking at the map, where it's sort of grayed out is the, the underlining zone. So I'm on Bridge Street. So I just wanted to verify. So the industrial, um, like where, where a lot of that industrial stuff is, doesn't have a lot of homes around it. So it's great. You know, we like to be multi-purpose, but if the building across the street from me wants to become a brewery or a distillery it, it, or a lighting, you know, a, a special permits needed, but where commercial currently is, shouldn't that be encouraged, but where it's more residential in that overlap, that just makes me a little, you know, does, am I being protected or, or not? Does something come in that, you know, I'm looking out my windows, it's basically coffee time is two doors from me, which is fantastic. Um, but everything else around me is, is pretty much that residential. So where you've got the people who do the, the car shop and the, you know, sharpening the blades and all that, it's great to walk to, but there's a lot of that business there. So I just, if you could speak to protecting when it becomes an overlay for industrial that can blend into these other areas is, can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that, that you're concerned that's, that's a, a valid one. And I think that's something we, we need to consider. And, and that's why we're having these forums to take those thoughts into um, consideration. Um, I, I would, the one thing I would note just from a market perspective is anywhere that there is existing residential um, from, we know from our market analyses, it would be extremely unlikely that it would convert from a residential development to a light industrial development. Um, I, I don't see that happening anytime in the near future. Um, others might, might disagree or have other um, uh, opinions about that, but we just know that the, the, the demand for residential is just so high that you, you wouldn't have residential displaced for, for light industrial. But in your general, your concern is something that I think we, we need to consider. Yeah, we don't know what the future is, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, Chris, really quickly before we move on, can you just clarify what the um, sort of gray, like see-through overlay thing is on the map? Thank you, I should have clarified that. So the all the all the main corridors going into the city those main streets going into the city are referred to as entrance corridors and they also have an overlay district already um, so that's showing that bridge street neck is in an entrance corridor and that gives it some additional protection this overlay will be in a line with that but add even more to it so that's showing that the entire bridge street is an entrance corridor Awesome. Um, okay, so actually, it looks like before we move on, John, um, John Henry has a, a question or comment. Yeah, I just, um, I'm not super familiar with the, the parking zoning regulations, so I uh, just had a general curiosity there of like, what is the intent behind the minimum parking spots for different uh, places? Like, if somebody wanted to develop a two-family home without parking, or a commercial place thought they could get by on foot traffic and, and would be okay with a small parking lot, like, why can't we just like, the market figured that out, so to speak, right? Like the price would probably, the home of the, uh, the price of the home probably be lower. You know, the business would be taking more of a risk that they couldn't have people drive up. Um, I'm just curious why those kind of things are in play at all. I, I just don't uh, have context there. That, that's an, it's an excellent point. And it's, it's a huge, I would say still debate among the planning community. Um, I, I think, I actually would tend to agree with you that in general, we should be as flexible as possible to, to let the market work. Um, the concerns tend to be about people. So if there was only a certain amount of, if there were no requirements, let's say for residential, 
the concern would be that people were, are still going to buy cars and they're just going to park all their cars on the side streets. Um, and so having a certain minimum, make sure that um, those cars would be parked on site. Um, so that, that's just one example. As it relates to commercial, one of the ways that is proposed to allow a, a reduction from what is um, actually um, required would be based upon if there are spaces upon, um, you know, outside your door, then that could count, um, take off from what is, would otherwise be re required. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a huge um, discussion point. Um, generally speaking, most members of the community want minimums, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why they're there. And Amanda or, um, or Castle Medora, if you want to add on to that, please feel free. I okay. think when we were having the discussion, this is Christy Mador, um, when we were having a discussion in the working group about how to make this corridor less auto oriented. So in the interest of reducing traffic volume and drive through traffic, what are the types of uses that actually generate traffic that is not residential? So we try to take out those types of uses. For example, fast food drive throughs was one that came up. Uh, we felt that that wasn't within character of the neighborhood, even though they are existing and we would like to preserve them, but we don't want to encourage more of those traffic volume generating uses. So that's one way that we thought about uh, making this corridor less auto dependent. But as Chris said, uh, we do feel that in order to make this um, overlay more palatable, we do have to incorporate some level of minimum parking that's reasonable and not excessive. I hope that helps. So Christian, if we could now move on. Um, I, I also just wanna note for people, I, I, don't, I didn't say this at the beginning, but we're, we're looking to, to wrap this up within an hour and a half, essentially. So um, I think we're, we're um, just slightly behind schedule, but that was the biggest part of the um, mm -hmm. presentation. So I think the next parts will, will go a bit quicker. Um, and I also see Gretchen, you do have your hand raised. Were you, um, was that from before or just? by your reaction, I think that was just left on from before. So I'll keep moving. Um, I just want to note something real quick. So for folks, you know, this is a lot of information to take in. And if you're not ready to provide comments tonight, that's okay too. The website does have a survey. And really what the survey is, is just showing these big chunks of the ordinance and asking for your reaction and comments to it. And so you can go ahead and provide comments there. And this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted on the website. So if you are listening and you're not here tonight, you have the opportunity to provide comments on the survey as well. Thanks. So we're now kind of moving into the actual physical realm of the development. So this section, we're gonna be talking about the lot standards and requirements and some of the um, more basic building requirements. So um, part of the visioning process was um, we did a what's called a visual preference survey where people really ch were choosing a number of different buildings that they felt would kind of fit within um, along Bridge Street, the corridor that they liked. And what I have here on the um, on the slide is kind of the top choices. And as you can see, that there's no sort of one specific style of buildings that people liked. And, and that's actually really appropriate for Bridge Street because there's no one specific style of buildings along Bridge Street. It, it's really sort of evolved over the years with um, kind of the predominant types of architecture of the times. Um, but you, you can see that there are some aspects that are sort of common. So generally people were comfortable with basically three-story buildings. Um, there were some people that actually did want to go higher, but that was a little bit more of an outlier. Um, I, I think more people than not wanted sort of roofs with different types of pitches, um, but that also there were a number of people that also liked sort of more modern and flat roof style buildings. So that sort of helps then inform what are the various requirements that we have. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'll start with what are called the lot standards. So this is the lot themselves, so not the building. What are the requirements? And I'll hit a, just a couple highlights. Um, so one is, well, we have a minimum lot size. Um, and this lot size, 5,000 square feet, it's actually quite small. Um, and it's smaller than what the any of the existing base zoning districts are within the neighborhood along the corridor. And the reason for that is many of the parcels are actually around 5,000 square feet. So we have a lot of really small parcels and that's actually a good thing. It helps sort of give this sort of um, more, more unique feel of smaller buildings. And so we wanted to make sure that we 
uh, we're allowing that to kind of continue to occur. So that's why we choose um, a small minimum lot size. Um, another important aspect that people tend to really um, focus on is the front setback. So how far away from the public right of way, which is typically the sidewalk, it, does a building need to be sited? Many of the buildings are right up against the sidewalk and we think that, so therefore, and that's what people liked. Um, so that's continuing to be allowed as part of the overlay district. Um, but there are situations where it might make sense to allow a little bit of a setback um, to put, for example, people really like the idea of allowing restaurant, a little bit of restaurant seating or cafe seating outside, um, outside of, of a, a building. And so 10 feet allows that. The ordinance itself also has requirements for what is not allowed within that front yard setback. And, and so, for example, one of the things is, is parking. It, it, it notes that it should be used for um, more quote unquote active uses. Um, another thing I would just finally highlight is open space. So it's, it's pretty typical in these types of environments where if you have a residential component that there's some percentage of that land should be um, open space. Um, and 15% and is, is a pretty sort of general benchmark that is used. And then there are requirements for what counts as open space. So if you have a, a common rooftop, a roof deck, that could be considered open space. If you have a private balcony, that is not considered open space. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, we, we people generally wanted um, three-story buildings. And we have actually two um, maximum heights, depending on the type of roof line. And I, I put this diagram just to kind of illustrate the reasoning for that. So um, a 35 foot maximum is appropriate and, and allows for a flat roof build, building. Um, if you go to the next slide, allowing a little bit more height will allow for pitched roof building. So you, you really wouldn't most likely be able to get a pitched roof building if you capped it at 35 feet. So for a pitched roof, allowing that little bit, few extra feet can allow you to get a building with a, that's a, not just a flat roof, but with a pitch um, and, and still feel, have that kind of nice neighborhood, um, you know, what we often say human scale feel to it. Um, so that, that's why, the, that's where the proposal comes from for 38 and 35 feet, depending on the roof type. Uh, next slide. Okay, so do we have a poll now that is working, Christian, or should we <laughs> move on? We do have the uh, some polls. I'm going to launch this one is in a sec in a different um, poll, but I think it would be worth it to launch the original polls too, <laughs> just to give us a chance to get those out of the way. Um, one of the questions is how familiar familiar you are with zoning. So hopefully everyone is now an expert. Um, from Chris's excellent and Amanda's excellent presentation. So I'm going to launch that poll and then after that poll is done, I'll launch the other one. Christian, could you just explain how people fill out this poll? Yes. So the poll should have popped up on your screen um, and you will be, you should be able to respond to the poll. You'll have to um, scroll down to answer all of the questions. Thank you. All right. Christian. So Oh, I was going to ask if people can see the, the polling results. Yes, uh, we're, I was just waiting for one other person to respond, but we can end it. Okay. So share the results. So it looks like everyone who responded said that they're moderately familiar. Most people are somewhat familiar with zoning. Um, uh, a few people are slightly or not at all. So hopefully after today and after the website, um, you're more familiar. There is an FAQ, Amanda mentioned this, an FAQ and um, some more zoning, general zoning information on the website. So please make sure to check that out. Um, pretty even split of um, folks who are folks as gender. And then um, uh, most also kind of 
average distribution for age. Um, and uh, looks like 75% of the folks who are joining us today identify as white. And there's um, some folks who identify as Asian, Black, and Hispanic or Latinx. So I'm going to stop sharing that poll. Um, and let me bring up the other poll. So um, this is uh, just reflects the poll that's on the screen and it's building requirements. So by right um, is that it's not discretionary. It would be allowed as long as it does not exceed the maximum allowed height by a special permit. It means that it is discretionary, which means the planning board would need to make findings that the building meets the design objectives of the district and the other is no preference. So I see we've got about half of folks who have participated. And again, the question is how should flat roof buildings be allowed? And is that based on what was shown earlier, the minimum of like the 35 and then the pitch, the 38? Correct. I realize now that I did not put the question text in the poll. Um, so that's confusing. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, how should flat roof buildings be allowed? And I can scroll back to these images if that's helpful for folks. I think that's I think that's good. I think it Great. looks like most people have responded. So I'm gonna end the poll and show the results. It looks like a pretty tight race, but by right had 60% of the responses and by special permit had 40%. Um, and nobody chose no preference. Thank you. And so again, that's just relates to whether people feel like allowing, a, uh, if people should just allow a flat roof again, as, as assuming it meets the the um, other requirements, um, then that most people feel like slightly that that should be allowed by right. So thank you, Christian, for setting those up. Um, so we can go to then the next if, slide. So this next aspect is another really kind of confusing aspect, I think, to a lot of people, again, including planners. And it has to do with a requirement for what is the density requirement um, if there's residential. And so right now we are um, tentatively stating that the maximum residential density is 16 units per acre. Um, but we wanna know what does that actually mean? So we're gonna show a bunch of slides that actually try and help you visualize what 16 units per acre means in this context, because you have to keep in mind that most parcels are less than one acre. Um, and so we, this map um, looks at what is there today for, for residences, sorry, for parcels where you actually have residential units we looked at what is the actual density today. And you can see there's some that are up above 40 in the kind of darkish purple. It looks purple to me, but some people say I'm a little colorblind. Um, but 83% of residential properties along Bridge Street that have residential are actually greater than 16 units per acre. So it's, it's already quite, you know, by that standard dense. So if you go through to, through to the next slide, um, I'm just gonna show these very quickly. But I just want people to kind of get in a sense that a lot of these buildings, they are fairly small, um, really great architecture. This one on Bridge Street, it's 17 units per acre. Um, and so again, that's above 16 or close to 17 units per acre. Um, and that's gonna be the theme. So if you go to the next. Um, I'm sorry. So basically that particular space, if somebody wanted to redo it, they could put 16 units in? No, that... no, 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 that's what I'm not. That's what I'm, thank you for the. Okay clarification because I'm trying to explain 16 units per acre means in this context this building that you see on this screen is almost 17 units per acre because it's so much less than an acre so you couldn't even under the overlay district you actually couldn't even build this you could only build two units because building three units go rises above 16 units per acre so if you go to the next slide um, so this is another example. Again, this building, this two units, it's 17 units per acre today. Next slide. This is another one that's almost 17 units. Um, that's two units. It's, there's only two units, but it's 17 units per acre. Next slide. 
And here's one that's just under, that's about 16 units per acre. Next slide. This one's again, just, just under uh, basically 16 units per acre. And I, I think really the, the theme here is that these are small buildings, only a couple units, and this is hitting already basically the max that would be allowed in here. And, and it's really just to help ensure that people understand that this zoning is not going to allow these sort of like monstrosity of buildings. When we say 16 units per acre, when we say 16 units per acre, it means this, that you're looking on the screen. Um, next slide. Here's another one, it's over 17 units per acre. And is that the last one? Well, I think this is the last one. This one, there's only one unit. It's a very small parcel. It basically is 19 units per acre. Um, so I think, I know we're, we're gonna pause in a minute, but I, I see Gretchen has her hand up and I'll, I'll let you just ask maybe if there's a clarifying question, because I know this can be a little confusing. Uh, how can I phrase this as a question? So it's um, basically to the point of like, if you have three units in a small, foot space, and then you have two to three adults per unit. That's my point about the cars. I just, that's a great way of illustrating a beautiful home with a three, two or three units, everyone's happy in there, but it does create a lot of adults in those units because that's how they can afford it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's great we're talking about this because it's not to um, judge how people design these beautiful homes, but the density is really important um to our community like how dense do we want this to be and to your point if you then lined up five or six of these it, it's going to look a lot different than just one of these residents on a parcel did i make that a question i don't think so so i'm going to say that's okay thank what you. is <laughs> I thank you for the comment. I think again that that's why we want to hear these concerns, and I don't necessarily have a, a specific response at this moment, but I, I think that's that's um, the type of thing that we're looking to hear. Um, so next slide. So again, now this is kind of a little bit of a reverse from the earlier map, but what we looked at, if there was 16 units per acre, how many units could you actually get on these parcels? Most of them are this lighter yellow that you'd only be able to get um, two units, um, a number of them also maybe three units. That's basically what you're looking at. There's one outlier parcel, that's that dark red. That's um, the Clipper Ship in parcel today. Um, and that's the only parcel that would actually be much higher. But that parcel is big enough that they actually have a whole separate zoning that they could um, use for if they wanted to develop. That's called a planned unit development um, that, that they would probably likely take advantage of anyway. I also want to note that with this map, the analysis strictly looked at the lot size and how many units that could accommodate. It doesn't look at the parking requirements, and there are parking requirements. Didn't look at the open space requirements, the setbacks. Um, and so when you add all that in, it actually reduces how many units you could feasibly build on the lot. So this is one of many variables. So it's a sort of that baseline view. Um, and if it helps, so 16 units is what would be allowed if you had a parcel that was an acre large. Um, that's 43,560 square feet. Most parcels along the district are only 5,000 square feet. So that's where you get to the, you know, max around one to two units. Uh, could I ask a clarification question? So um, is this overlay wanting to give the opportunity to put more units in or keep it the same? Uh, my feeling is we're, we're kind of overpopulated. So if we're, if the question is, the overlay gives the opportunity for developers to add more. I'd be more wanting to be what it is or less. Uh, again, parking, uh, you know, just population wise, it's not to be overcrowded with multiple units and in, in small spaces. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm just not understanding. Is it with that overlay, are you looking that to make it more than 16 or just keep it as it is currently? So our proposal is to keep it at 16, which is actually lower than what it, 
what it is today, because as I showed on some of those pictures, many of them today were actually 17, 18, or even more units per acre. There's a number of them um, that, that are further south along the corridor that are actually about around in the 40 units per acre. They're very, by that measure, considered very dense. And that's because those are probably examples where we had previously non-conforming buildings that are going to another non-conforming, and, and that's how they were able to do that. Again, this goes back to using this um, overlay district to control what the future development is um, so that it is in, in, at a scale and character um, that the community- well, Wonderful, Th that, thank you. I wasn't understanding until you said that, so perfect, thank you. Great, okay. Thank you, Christian, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, just uh, pause on this for one second. Uh, one other aspect to the building requirements that people really wanted was, especially where you have commercial on your ground floor, people really want lots of buildings. They don't want to walk next to a blank wall. And so we have requirements, this is called glazing, that are requirements for how much basically windows you need to have um, for both whether it's a commercial or a residential space. So Essentially, we take all of these things, um, and if you go to the next slide, this really all kind of translates then into this table. Um, so it's a, a lot of work to kind of drill down into what is this table. And so this shows what are the exam, what are the different building heights that are allowed. Um, you can see ground floor glazing. You can see it has to be 60% for commercial. Um, what we're going to see in the next section is that we then describe, well, how do we actually calculate these things? Like what is glazing? What, what does that actually mean? Um, and so um, same thing with um, vertical facade modulation. I'll, I'll explain, explain what that means. So we know it has to be 40 feet, but there's other parts of the ordinance that then explain what that means and how do you actually achieve that? So yeah, I think um, this is another good session, a uh, sec time to pause. Um, I know we've already been taking a few questions, but I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of take additional comments as it relates to the, the lot standards and this aspect of the building requirements that, we, um, that we've discussed. Um, Christian, do you want to stop sharing for a moment? Sure. Um, so I have gotten one question uh, in the chat from Gretchen, and that is, are there other communities that have similar zoning already? Um, yes, um, there are, absolutely. But I, I think, you know, one of the things we want to do, of course, is, is so in terms of similar zoning, um, there are many communities that have these sort of mixed use zoning, um, appropriate heights, but we always want to sort of make sure it's tailored to the, not just the community, but the actual neighborhood or street in this case, um, that's specific. And so the concepts that we're discussing with lot standards um, absolute, and building standards absolutely are in um, other communities, but the specifics might change a little bit. Um, you know, the, the parking requirements, I think are probably a, what I would consider a best practice for this kind of environment of a community. Um, but again, it might be a little different in a different community. So we got some input about the, the flat roofs. Um, again, I guess one thought is, you know, heights in general, do people feel comfortable with the, the three-story heights? Um, do people feel comfortable with the different styles of roofs? Um, I do see a thumbs up. Um, so I think that, that shows that that's good. Yeah, love the three stories. Pitch roofs are attractive because that's kind of this area. Flat roofs are great, but I, it makes me leery uh, in the winter because the flat roofs could could um, get a lot of snow but they're you know very attractive thank you that's follow-up comments so i was surprised at the poll results because i thought most people would share drew's sentiments that they would like to see more pitch roofs and therefore flat roofs should be more discretionary and not by right um i don't know if we should that folks, I don't know. Please, Ooh, everyone, I agree. Please, please speak up. It's true. <laughs> please speak up if you feel that way. And you were confused by the question. And you don't have to raise your hand to speak. <laughs> I, I agree. I was a little surprised. Um, there will be additional data points because there, hopefully, people are filling out the survey um, and 
We are also going to be giving this exact presentation next week for people who couldn't attend tonight. Um, so we might get a different response. Um, and I'd also say, please direct people to, to that your friends or neighbors to attend next week's meeting if they're not here tonight. The yeah. other thing I was surprised I about is the modern look. We are such a historic looking, you know, diverse, different eras, but the modern look I was surprised at. I think that flat roof question could use a little bit more, um, exp I don't know, a little bit more uh, de detail, uh, embellishment or em explanation, whatever. Yeah, we'll update that for the next meeting. Thank you for I guess one other question I would just have before we move on is in terms of this density issue, you know, you saw these buildings that are 17 units, um, even some 18 units that we showed. Does anybody here actually want the density raised from our proposed 16 to something higher? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, when you shared a couple of those examples that are right on the margin, um, those, those seemed okay to me, like the 16, five ones that were like the three unit in a nice historic house. So like the ones that are on the margin do seem close, not to like raise it to something crazy high, but, um, I thought those were interesting examples. Thank you, John Henry. I think I want to read out a comment I wrote is, um, we don't want to design something that's totally locking out businesses and developers completely or our community will fall apart and they might move out. So we don't want to develop something that's so difficult that somebody, everyone will leave and then we'll have empty buildings. So I know that sounds all doom and gloom, but we need to build a plan that is enough that it'll entice the right people who want to develop the way we want as well, but not freeze everyone. Thank you, Richard, great point. I think related to that, um, Kevin actually asked a question that says that was, will producing this overlay encourage um, any new businesses to move in? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. I mean, there are other, again, the, the vision plan, we have a number, we have a whole section on economic development and we have a number of recommendations um, that are directly tied to zoning. But one of the key things to the zoning is allowing and encouraging these types of commercial uses, which is exactly what this overlay district does. Um, if anybody else wants to add in, please feel free. And I'll just say with the design standards, you know, it makes it really clear and transparent for someone coming in. They know what their expectations are. Um, they know exactly <laughs> what they need to follow. And if for some reason, again, their development doesn't fit within that, they have that waiver option, but um, it, it's transparent what's expected from the front end. And so that's why we're, we're trying to make it a really clear process for everyone. So the community knows what's going to happen and the developer knows what to propose. Not to be doom and gloom, but with all this zoning, what happens, like think of the, the ward, the, the place that's down by the marsh that, that um, the developer went outside of our the current zoning and is putting in, we believe a, a, a rehab drug rehab. So there was zoning there, but they went someplace else and was able to whatever whatever that is. So when we're talking zoning, what protection do we have for a developer to come in and, and do that as well? So that particular property isn't part of this overlaid zip district. So what enough impact being impacted by the overlay um, but they are proposing a use that's exempt it's it's called um, a Dover amendment which essentially says um, limited site plan review is allowed but not full site plan review in that state legislation so that's a, a different type of use but with this overlay can anybody do these kinds of exemptions so so even though we go through this and we want to go through this and have ourselves protected, but people can, you know, skirt around things by using exemptions. Or does this protect us more? The exemptions are there, um, they're state exemptions, but uh, we're also looking at the market forces and along Bridge Street Neck, I mean, the market is going to be towards housing and commercial and those kinds of uses. And so it's more likely that you would see 
either our housing or commercial development than one of those exempt developments. I just want to say uh, to Gretchen, um, the example of um, is the, the, that antique um, store that was um, in the business on the corner. Um, she actually went out of business because she wanted to build a residential unit above her shop and that wasn't permitted. And this overlay would permit her to stay actually because it allows it, she could go either way. She could have it all business or what she needed was a residential unit above it and she would have been able to stay had we had the overlay. Thanks, Flora. And also, just, just so we're still on this economic development topic, I think the scale of First Street Neck really is conducive to bringing in smaller businesses. So you don't really need a lot of capital to build a small business on the ground floor, like the Che Casa that we saw, the record store, and smaller businesses like that is what we heard overwhelmingly from the neighborhood is what you want to desire. And New Market, I don't believe that was more than a thousand square feet. So this overlay actually preserves that scale rather than these bigger kind of chain store uses that you, you I think neighbor, the neighbors wouldn't really want to see uh, in the future. So I think this actually supports smaller businesses to come in. And also the industrial uses that Amanda was uh, speaking to earlier, we're really thinking kind of the light manufacturing side of things. We're not saying that people will be bringing in a lot of industri heavy industrial. We're thinking like people maybe out of the pandemic want to have a home-based business, maybe making jewelry or becoming um, furniture makers. Those are the types of the smaller light manufacturing businesses that would I feel very appropriate for a neighborhood like this one. And that's, that was the intent of bringing the lighter industrial uses to this overlay. Thank you. Um, Christian, why don't we turn back on the screen? We have one more section to go through. And also I saw looking at John Henry's screen, I think we have to update our demographics because we now do have a zero to five um, member who has joined this. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so the last section now is, and this is something that is a little bit, I wouldn't say unique, it's less common to include in, a, in an ordinance, but we're seeing it more often, and we're especially seeing this in mixed-use types of environments where people have a really strong interest in the design of the building. And so that's, so what we've included are these two things, they're called design guidelines and design standards. These are things, sometimes people hear form-based code. Um, these are kind of incorporating elements of a form-based code into the ordinance. And it really puts a primacy on the form of the building. Um, what people said was they, they didn't wanna dictate a specific architectural style that wouldn't really be appropriate for Bridge Street Neck, which has so many types of architecture, but people just want high quality. And there are some sort of standards and principles that people um, wanted included. So we have, Design guidelines, these are things that are a little bit more subjective, um, advisory. They're intended to just help convey holistically um, to a, a developer sort of what the vision is and, and how kind of generally speaking design can help achieve that. Then we have standards. These are measurable, they're, they're required unless you get a waiver. Um, and, and that's something that has to be actually met to help achieve um, kind of these goals. Uh, next slide. And so I'm not going to go again through much detail, but I just wanted to kind of show what we did was we took some of the diagrams directly from the vision plan and we brought them into the zoning overlay district. And then what we have here is for design guidelines, there are things like building orientation, building mass, uh, this list that you see, we then describe what we mean and what's the relevance to achieving the vision. So people want buildings that are oriented to Bridge Street itself, um, as opposed to sort of interior facing the wrong way. Uh, people want the parking, the, the impact of parking to be reduced. And this sort of explains why that is. Um, 
thinking about sensitive building height that especially when you're around um, adjacent properties that are maybe historic in nature so that you, there are ways to sort of be sensitive to that. Um, next slide. And just a few other of these categories, each of which, again, like I said, are explained in the ordinance here, the way that the facade is actually organized, um, where you have ground floors, um, to the extent possible, having what we call active ground floor uses. So that would be things like your um, a restaurant or other types of retail stores, um, the importance of ground floor um, windows and other treatments like canopies and architectural details that, again, we're not dictating certain things that need to be included, but we're explaining why we think they might be important. Uh, zoning also can't dictate specific types of materials to be used, but we can encourage them. We can say what the community likes and what the community does not like. And so that's what we've included. So it starts with the design guidelines and then the next slide we then move into the standards. So again, these are things that are actually required now. Um, and so one of them, as you see here, is how, the way the building is actually masked. Um, and the reason for this, including this, is what you have today are, are some generally basically simple massings along Bridge Street. And this, again, helps ensure that future buildings um, are, are that way. Next slide. Uh, we have standards for the types of roofs that are allowed. Um, again, we have the different um, pitched roofs, mansard, hip, gable, that these are all things we see on Bridge Street today. Um, flat roofs, again, uh, right now we had tentative as, a, as by a special permit. Um, I know we've had some new feedback tonight, so that might be updated. Um, what does it mean to articulate a building and what's the purpose of it? So the guidelines explain the purpose of it to kind of break down the mass of, of a really large building so it doesn't feel so big. This here um, that explains, well, how do you actually achieve that? And then the table that I showed earlier says, well, how often do you need to achieve that? And that in this case, every 40 feet, you need to have these articulation elements. Next slide. And then another piece that we've included, and this is getting a little bit more, um, I guess, detailed than uh, uh, not all ordinances, but some other ones that I've seen is including what we're calling building components. Um, the intent of this is to, again, provide clarity on what the expectations for design are, but also be flexible. And these building components, I'll show what I mean in a second, they apply for the facades along Bridge Street. And again, there's the opportunity that if, if there's something not in this list, um, a developer can potentially um, build it, but again, they would just have to um, apply for a special permit and essentially make the case for why the design um, you know, will help the, um, the development in the neighborhood. Next slide. So the top list up there, these are what these components are. So things like a bay window, a dormer, all of the things in this list are there today on Bridge Street. Um, the bottom half of the screen, what these are, these are explain then, these are the, the, the details for each of these components. Um, you know, the, and, and it might, it, it varies on what the actual component is, but things like the width, how much it can project out, the height, things like that, as well as other standards. Next slide. So we just wanted to show just quickly a couple examples, again, along Bridge Street, that these are sort of the inspiration for what's allowed. So things like a porch, the dormers, bay windows, cross gables, shed dormers. Next slide, a few more. Um, porticos and stoops and, and side wings. So again, these are all the types of what we're talking about when we say building components, um, which are explained in, in the ordinance. And then finally, the last piece um, before we again, we'll do one more break and take some more comments um, has to do with, with screening standards. Um, so things like your loading facilities, your service areas, mechanical equipment. Um, the, the real theme here is that they should be as unobtrusive as possible. So they should be screened or fully enclosed. Um, if for roof mounted mechanical equipment, they should be set back so you can't see it from the, um, as you're walking along the street. If they emit noise, then they're, you know, we want to make sure that they, they um, aren't, um, don't have adverse effects on abutting properties. So those are the few things that are included in, the, in this section of the ordinance. 
So if you go to the next slide, yep, I think that was everything. Um, we can stop sharing the screen for a moment. Um, what we'll do is we'll take some questions or comments on everything that I just noted on the design standards. Um, we are about at an hour and a half now, so I think we're, we're running just a little bit behind. Um, then we just have a couple more quick kind of logistics slides for next steps and whatnot. Um, but before we get to that, I guess I just want to see how their comments as it relates to what I just presented on design elements. So again, I'm not too surprised. I know it's been a long night um, <laughs> for covering a lot. Um, I, I think, um, actually I see Gretchen, you have your hand up, so please go ahead. Yeah, I always have my hand up. Um, quick question. Uh, do you think drive-throughs are already permitted along Bridge Street Neck? I know Bill and Bob, uh, Bill and Bob's has one, but I remembered somebody asking me once if that was permitted or not. Yeah, so they are allowed in some of the zoning districts. If you remember, there are four different districts um, in the B2 and in the B4. So if you go by colors, the brown and the navy blue allow drive-through. Um, as a relief. So, so can I ask if somebody um, were not in those zones right now and they wanted to have a drive-through, with or without the overlay, how does the overlay impact that? So it, it doesn't. Um, if someone is not in the B2 or B4 zone and they want to add a drive-through, well, I guess I should rephrase that. If they are, they are already a non-conforming use and they want to convert to a drive-through, which would be a non-conforming use, they could apply to do that but they would need to demonstrate to the zoning board that it is a um, less detrimental use. So that's the current process. The proposed overlay does not allow drive-throughs. And so it doesn't change what would be what they would be allowed to do. Thanks, Amanda. Um, you know, I'm, I'd say, I, obviously, if there are comments as it relates to the design, you know, there are a number of avenues to, to provide your input. I'm actually not that surprised that there aren't too many comments because this all came really directly from the vision and the community put a, a lot of work into articulating sort of the type of character of buildings. Um, so I, I think it's, it's not too surprising. Um, but again, if, if people have comments, not right now, they, they're, there's a number of ways to provide those comments um, in the future. Christian, do you want to, on that note, turn on the slides? Um, you know, just so we kind of first talk about, you know, what are the next steps? We, again, like, I, as we noted, we have another forum that's basically going to be the exact same one as this um, tonight, next week. Um, we're also getting feedback on the website. And so we'll be able to take that input and then synthesize that and make, modify the, what, you know, is what, a working draft right now of the ordinance. Um, we have a, a working group of a number of community members um, that live in the neighborhood or business owners um, and other interested parties um, who will then, you know, we'll, we'll get their feedback, continue to get their feedback on this. Again, this is always an iterative process, so we'll be continuing to make changes to the ordinance. And eventually, and then looking into the fall, um, there will be a, a public hearing, which is the, a first step um, to actually adopting an ordinance. Um, Christian, do you want to talk about office hours and how that works? Sure. So um, on the Bridge Street Neck website, which I just posted the link in the chat, you will have the opportunity to schedule a 15 minute um, office hours appointment with um, MAPC staff. Um, and that is just an opportunity for us to answer any questions that you might have about the overlay, um, the questions that you might have from reading the website or from going to a forum. Um, and so the way that you can do that, I actually uh, want to show you on the website, but the way that you can do that is that if you go to the Bridge Street Neck website, um, you'll see this tab list here 
this has a lot of information on it. So I do really encourage all of you to visit this website in general. Um, but if you scroll over, you'll see not only is there a survey, so you can respond to the survey and it has some of the same questions that we asked you today, um, but on office hours, it will give you the opportunity to schedule something with us. So the way that you would do that is you would just click on office hours. Um, we have our available times listed here, but we're using a tool called Calendly, which lets you select a date and then it will actually add a, um, it will add a, an appointment to my calendar um, with a Zoom link already generated. Um, and then you'll meet with um, myself or Chris um, for about 15 minutes. Um, and that will, so, so that's an opportunity for folks to um, follow up with us with some more questions. Okay. Um, Amanda, is there anything else you wanna cover or clarify before we adjourn tonight? Oh, just a reminder that the meeting is recorded. And so if you know people who are interested, um, you think might be interested, please let them know about this. There's that other forum on Thursday, August 26th, but if they can't attend, they can watch the video um, and provide input on the website. So just reiterating that. All right, well, thank you everyone for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, follow up with us um, here. On, you can see on the screen just before we leave, there's also emails. Um, so you can, another way to get in touch with um, any of us. So thanks again um, and have a good night. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye everyone.